Hello friends, my name is Pastor Jesse here at Peckway Church of Whitehorse. I want to welcome you into what is week number three already of our study that we're calling Not a Fan, How to Become. In this series, we're seeking to become fully committed, completely committed followers of Jesus Christ. We're looking at different passages of scripture, different interactions that Jesus has with individuals and how he challenged them, invited them to deepen their relationship and commitment in following him, or maybe for some of them, become for the first time his Follower. So tonight in this study, again, it's week number three, and we're looking at Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. So 10 verses on our study docket for the night. And I would invite you right now, as we've done for the first two weeks, I'd invite you right now to just hit the pause button on the YouTube or Facebook video that you're watching. Pause the video and take the time to reflect if we read Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35, and then come back and we'll dive into the study. So thank you for reading the scripture and coming back with us now. Again, we're looking at Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. And in my response after reading this passage, a passage that we're familiar with, but every time that I read it, my response is always, wow, there's a lot of hard things here. There's a lot of hard things to hear. There's a lot of hard things to understand. Certainly, there are a lot of hard things to live out. Maybe take a moment here and you can pause the video again if you want. Again, that's the beauty of coming along on demand. You can go at your own pace. You can pause the video. Take a moment to think what stands out most to you in this passage. What is the hardest to hear? What is the hardest to live out? What is the hardest to understand in this passage? And I know as I think about that, and, and I want to uh, uh, think about the two things that are hardest for me, and there are actually two words that are hardest for me to understand. And I want to take the time to actually unpack just those two words, what Jesus means in these two words. And I think it'll be influential to the rest of our study as we go verse by verse in a moment. But before we do that, let's start with first the word hate. And then I want to look at the word salt, that imagery of salt that Jesus uses, not only here but elsewhere in Scripture, to describe our relationship with him and our discipleship and our following with him. So hate, Jesus tells us here, to hate. Let's start there. Not only did Jesus tell us to hate, but Jesus tells us to hate those closest to us, those that we love the most, to hate our own families. In fact, he says that if we do not hate our own family, if we do not hate our children, our mother, our father, our wives, our spouse, we cannot be his disciples. And of course, the implication of that is if we do not hate our family, if we do not hate our children, if we do not hate our parents, if we do not hate our spouse, then we are not his disciples. This very seemingly, very frankly, seems counter to Jesus. It seems counter to his ways. It seems counter to what we think it should be to be his disciple. So the question is, what does Jesus mean when he says that we need to hate our family if we are to be his disciple? Well, let's look at a few other places where the biblical idea or the ancient Near East idea of hate, the ancient Near East idea and meaning of hate is lived out and we can better understand what Jesus means in, in this use of hate. We need to understand that hate in Jesus' day is different than the hate that we think of and live out in our day. So, and hate in our day first, let's start there. Let's start with what we know. What does hate in our day mean? Well, if you use verb as a hate, to hate, hate means to, to feel intense or passionate disdain for someone or something. The noun version of hate is intense or passionate disdain. So hate in our day is to have or to live out intense feelings of disdain, intense feelings of dislike. It is to detest that which you hate. Hate is a feeling that we have, but it's also lived out in our lives, right? Many of us say that we hate winter, the season that we're about to enter into. So what do we do? We spend a minimum amount of time outside. In view of the football season that we're in the midst of, many of us would have NFL teams that we would say that we hate. And so what do we do? We don't cheer for those teams. In fact, we cheer against those teams. I love NASCAR. There's many drivers that NASCAR fans say that they hate. And what do they do? They, don't, they not only not cheer for those drivers, but they actually cheer against those drivers. They detest those drivers. They disdain those teams. They strongly dislike those individuals. And we understand hate in our day, but what about hate in Jesus' day? Because again, it is quite different. Hate in Jesus' day is not feelings of disdain, it's not feelings of detest, but it is, it is rather to clearly choose, to clearly prioritize one thing over another thing. 
To hate something in Jesus' day is not to detest it. It's not to degrade it. It's to choose it, though. It's to choose something over another something. It's to prioritize something over another something. The Bible gives us some examples of this type of ancient Near East hating elsewhere in Scripture. Think back to the life of Jacob. First, the life of Jacob and his brother Esau. Remember the moment back in Genesis where Jacob and his mother Rebekah scheme, or I should say, yeah, Jacob and his mother Rebekah scheme up a way to steal his older brother's rightful birthright as the firstborn son of Isaac. Esau, because of his hunger, and I will certainly add because of his foolishness, he is said to have hated his birthright in that moment. Now, did Esau really hate his birthright in the sense that we think of hate? Did, did Esau hate the fact that his birthright gave him automatic rights to his father's estate? That there was this supreme and good value that came with his birthright? Did Esau hate that supreme and good value? I mean, having your father's birthright was a, was a blessing. It was a good thing. So did Esau hate that? Did he disdain that? Did he detest that good thing, that blessing that was given to his life as the firstborn son? No, of course not. Rather, what Esau did in that moment, the way that he lived out this form of hatred that the Bible attests to, is he chose, he prioritized that bowl of soup that Jacob used to scheme and to steal his birthright. He prioritized that bowl of soup over his birthright in that moment, and then he suffered for the rest of his life the consequences of that foolish mispriority. Mispri so think about it a little bit. Think about later into Jacob's life. Jacob then, after this, and because of this, he runs away and he goes to the house of Laban. And there he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. And so Jacob agrees to work for Laban for seven years to earn the right to marry Laban's daughter, Rachel. But Laban then tricks Jacob into marrying his older daughter, Leah, first. And Jacob there is said to have hated Leah. Now, did he hate Leah in the way that he had a great disdain for Leah? Did he detest Leah? Well, no, he had seven children with Leah, so I don't think he detested her or disdained her too much, right? But what Jacob clearly did was he chose Rachel over Leah. He prioritized Rachel over Leah. His first love, his truest love, his deepest love was with Rachel and not with Leah. So when Jesus says that we need to hate our family to be his disciples, it does not mean that the first thing that we have to do when coming to Jesus in faith is call our father and mother, is to call our children, is to call our spouse, and to say, hey, I, Jesus says that I have to hate you. It does not mean that we have to or should detest our family. It does not mean that we should or should detest our loved ones. It certainly should not mean that we should detest our own life, which Jesus also refers to here. But what it does mean, and, and here's where things continue to get live, get be hard to live out, even with our proper understanding of the type of hatred that Jesus is referring to here. What this does mean, and that Jesus is quite clearly in saying this, is he is challenging us to prioritize him, our relationship with him, above all other relationships. Even the relationships with us that we hold most dear, that with our parents, that with our spouse, that with our children, that with our own life. Jesus, our relationship with him needs to be priority number one. In each and every one of our lives, there exist priorities. There is a thing in which that is always given top billing. There's a thing in which we'll always have priority one. There's a thing in which we will choose above all other things. There's a thing in which our full allegiance lies. There's a thing that never gets second best. It can be good things even, like our family. It can be good things like our children, like our job. It could be our wealth. It could be our health. It could be our power. It could be our position. It could be our retirement. It could be our safety. It could be our comfort. It could be any number of good things and, and any number of things. But here's the deal. Jesus shows us here that it should be him. That Jesus shows us that he very bluntly tells us that it needs to be him that it needs to be him, that he needs to be priority number one. He needs to get the top shelf and top billing in our lives if we are to be his disciples. Jesus must be ruler. He must be priority number one in our life, and our must that life then must speak to that through both our words and our actions. So Jesus' invitation here is, is a command, really, to evaluate our priorities, to evaluate what it is that gets top and first billing in our lives. It's an invitation to leave all while simultaneously gaining all. So again, summarize this. Hate in our day 
is uh, feelings of disdain. Hate, hate the Jesus way is appropriate priorities. So that's a better understanding of Jesus' call to hate. But what about salt? Why does Jesus like to refer to his disciples and our discipleship as salty, right? Why does he refer to us as salt and, and challenge us to be like salt? Well, we know what salt does. Salt is the same today as it was in Jesus' day. It has a twofold role in our lives. It preserves and it seasons. If you put enough salt on a piece of meat, that piece of meat, whether it's refrigerated or not, that piece of meat is going to be preserved. It's going to stay preserved. It's going to stay in its original state. It's going to remain edible. And that's especially important in Jesus' day where they didn't have refrigeration, right? Meat to stay fresh long and long, for long periods of time, it needed to be seasoned in salt. It needed to be preserved in salt. But also, salt also seasons. And in light of the New Holland Fair and the Effort Affair in the past couple of weeks, there are a few things better than Fink's French fries doused in salt. Think about bacon. Bacon is good because it is doused in salt. Potato chips are addicting because they are doused in salt. So salt on one hand preserves, it maintains the integrity, and it maintains the, the matter, it ma maintains the state of items, but it also makes that item better, right? It both preserves and it seasons. It both preserves and makes better. Fink's French fries, they're pretty good without salt, but after you take that salt shaker and cover those fries in salt, they become out of this world fantastic. So again, salt simultaneously preserves while it is making better. So what does Jesus teach us about being his follower from the example of salt? Well, here is my one sentence summary of Jesus' teaching on salt. Disciples who do not exhibit the way of Jesus have lost their ability to both preserve, and I've used the word proclaim, the ways of Jesus or season the ways of Jesus. Think about this, what I mean by this. We have many contemporary, contemporary examples of this. Many examples of individuals, many examples of churches, many examples now of denominations who have lost their saltiness, who have forsaken what it is that made them salty, what it is that made them a disciple of Jesus Christ, what it is that gave them living, breathing, active faith in Jesus Christ in the first place. They have forsaken their marks of Christ-like discipleship. And how does that process start? Well, well, it starts by, by phrases like this. Well, well, I'm not sure that the Bible actually means that. You know, you come to a hard passage, a hard to understand, a hard to live out, a hard to reason and reckon with our modern culture and modern Western mind of thinking. And we start to twist the words of the Bible and say, well, I'm not sure that the Bible actually means that. I'm not sure that the Apostle Paul actually means that. I'm not sure that Jesus actually means that when you come to a hard passage like we're studying today. And then maybe it expands over time into, well, that, that's the Old Testament. We don't need that. We don't need to pay as much attention to that. We live in the Jesus area. We live in the New Testament area. We can unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Then it starts to balloon into what we touched on in our Holy Spirit study on Sunday, just, just yesterday. Well, those are Paul's words and not God's words, right? Jesus was all about circles and drawing lines of acceptance, but Paul was all about rules and morality. You see the path, what I'm trying to show us is the path from saltiness, the path from where Jesus calls us to come to and to stay, the path from the preservation of the faith that has been handed down to us through the word of God and the saints of God, the path that is, that, that path is, is never waking up one day and, and just saying outright, man, I don't believe this, this, and this about the Bible, rejecting this, this, and this about our faith, about our discipleship in Christ. Rather, to steal the old line from the Casting Crown song, it's a, it's a slow fade, right? It's, it's a slow journey from the preservation of the faith that we are called to in Jesus Christ, the preservation of the faith to remain salty as his followers to the manipulation of the faith, to the twisting of the faith, to the twisting of discipleship in Jesus Christ to being whatever it is that our itching ears want it to be, right? So Jesus says to us, once salt, once your faith, once your discipleship has lost its ability to preserve your faith, the faith, 
your discipleship has then lost its worth. It's lost what it was and what it was created to do, what it was given to you to give you the ability to do. To again, as salt, that second role of salt, to make better. Right? Salt makes things better. Jesus makes things better. His love, his light makes things better. Faith in Jesus Christ, following Jesus. When the church, when Christians preserve in the faith that was handed down to them, they make things better by the power of God, in the ways of God. They, Christians, following Jesus in this way, they make the world a more bright and beautiful in Jesus Christ's place. I mean, think about it for a moment. Think about the stark change that would take place in our world if the church just ceased to exist tomorrow. Think about all the things that would happen just in our backyard here in Lancaster County. Not only would the many various churches that sit on many corners of our world. Not only would they cease to exist, not only would there be a lot of property and real estate available in Lancaster County, but organizations like the factory, organizations like CrossNet, organizations like Water Street Rescue Mission, organizations like Align Life Ministry, if the church goes away, if the faith in Jesus Christ goes away, those organizations go away. And so our world, if the church if authentic faith in Jesus Christ, if the living out of authentic discipleship in Jesus Christ goes away, then the world takes a real nosedive. It takes a real turn for the worse. So we, the church, we Christians have a salty role to play, and it is a two-part role to play in the world. First, we are given primarily the role of preserving the faith. I guess I don't have that on the slideshow. We are first given the role of preserving the faith, of preserving the faith that was handed down to us, handed down to us first from the apostles. We talked about this yesterday in our study. The apostles are those that first encountered the resurrected, physical resurrected Christ, and then the countless generations that have passed down the faith to us. We are then forsaking our lives and our own faith, and then we are forsaking, if we do not pass down the authentic faith that was inspired through the apostles, that was inspired in the word of God by the Holy Spirit of God, if we do not pass that faith down, we are not only, uh, we are not only um, harming and manipulating our own faith, but we are harming and manipulating the faith of the saints that are to come behind us. As and when we do that, we also when we gain, I should say, when we maintain the authentic faith that has been passed down to the apostles, that has been passed down through the word of God, that has been passed down to us, we not only maintain the faith, but we gain the ability in Jesus' name to make the world a better place, to make things taste a little better in this dark and sin-filled world, to bring a little light and love, a little Jesus flavor into this perishing world. Christians, like salt, have a twofold role of preserving the faith and proclaiming the faith. So now with hate and salt, those two words better understood, let's start to walk through this passage. First, verse 25, Jesus or Luke records for us that large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, Jesus said, and let's pause there. The first thing we need to see in verse number 25 is this one is for everyone. This hard command, this hard challenge of to discipleship is, is for everyone. Pastor Eidelman, if you've been following along in the Not A Fan book that we've been reading as a companion between studies, he reminds us that our first two chapters of study, our first two scriptures of study were one-on-one -on -one interactions with Jesus, right? It was Nicodemus and Jesus late at night. It was Jesus and the woman and her faith. It was Jesus and Simon the Pharisee and his lack of faith. But now tonight, Jesus, this is another instance where Jesus has drawn large crowds of people. He's been performing miracles. He's been leaving the religious leaders, the elite, speechless with his teachings and his challenges to their teachings. And with that, he's drawn a crowd. But what Jesus knows he hasn't drawn is huge crowds of disciples, of authentic followers of his will and his ways. And so Jesus turns to the crowd. Remember, whenever a gospel writer like Luke records a detail like there were large crowds and Jesus turns to them and says, that's important. And what Jesus really turns to these large crowds, these large crowds of his day and these large crowds of our day, what he says to them and to us and to everyone on the planet is this is how. What I'm about to say to you is how you can go from just traveling with me 
from just moving with me from place to place to being actually present with me, to being actually in relationship with me, to actually following me, to actually living with me and living like me. Right? Many people, even on our day, travel with Jesus. Large crowds of people travel with Jesus in our day. They like to let Jesus take the wheel maybe in the hard times when they have no other place to turn. But few are actually giving Jesus the wheel all the time. And how we actually give Jesus the wheel is by giving Jesus center stage when it comes to our priorities. And that is what Jesus is about to challenge. He's about to challenge three areas of our priorities in our lives. And the first is in our relationship. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now we unpacked what hate meant in Jesus' day. Hate, again, is giving proper priority to the appropriate things in our lives, Jesus being the top build proper thing in our life. Jesus is always priority one. And this sort of takes the sting out of hate. It sort of can take the sting out of hearing Jesus first say that we need to hate mother and father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even our own lives to be his disciples. Our better understanding of ancient Near East hate can take some of the sting out of this challenge by Jesus. But don't miss that even with the proper understanding of the type of hate that Jesus is calling us to, that hate, this hate applied to our lives and our face, this claim and this call by Jesus to hate our families was just as, I would argue, even more shocking to his original hearers with their proper understanding of this type of hate to their ears than it was shocking to our ears. I mean, think about what we know was true of life, and particularly of family life, in Jesus' day. Family, the family, it was the center of anything. I mean, everything that you did and everything that you were. Family was the center. It was where you were given and lived out your religion. Family was at the center of any type of education that you were able to have. Family was your center for basic provision. Family was where your food, your shelter, your safety came. Remember, for now, women may, when they married off into another family, they may leave the homestead. But for men in particular, they would probably never leave their homestead. They would probably never leave their household. Households and family units were handed down from generation to generation. Every house, to put it in a modern context, every house had in-laws quarters, right? Families, large families, extended families lived and did life together. And a part of that was then you maintained the family business. The family business was your source of income. The parable of the lost son that is about to come in Luke chapter 15, the, the son's request for his inheritance early was so insulting, partly because he was not only squandering his inheritance, but he was squandering the family business. He was squandering the family inheritance. Right, The father, the other son, saw their family inheritance squandered by the youngest son. And so Jesus turns to the crowd and saying to everyone, hey, here is what it takes to follow me. It's to hate. It's to forsake your family. It's to place your family second. It's to place your life a distant second to me as a way of saying what he's about to say clearly in verse number 33 is those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. The word hate connected and directed towards family in our lives, was shocking to hear Jesus say because it meant what he is about to say, which is you have to give up, you have to renounce, you have to abandon ownership of all that you have, all your possessions, all your priorities, all your relationships, all of your life. And turn ownership, ultimate ownership of those things, ultimate priority of those things over to me. And so I think there are two implications of this call to count the costs that come with being a disciple of Jesus. The first is to give this serious consideration. Right In these ten short verses, Jesus does not leave a stone unturned in laying out the things that have to be placed second to him. The things that we have to give right priority in our lives compared to him. Second, the reason that you have to give such serious consideration is because you, if you embark in following Jesus in the way that Jesus calls you to follow him, you are about to experience a sudden life change. 
There is no way that you can follow Jesus in the way that Jesus is calling you to follow him. There is no way that you can adjust your priorities, the way that Jesus is calling you to adjust your priorities across the board of your life and not have serious and sudden life change come to your life. And so Jesus gives this, calls us to give this serious consideration and know that if you decide to follow, serious life change and priority change is coming. The first life change in priorities is in our relationships. The following Jesus, our relationship with Jesus is primary to all other relationships. Just as Jesus, the next area, gets priority in our planning. Jesus says in verse 27 through 32, Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose your king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Here again, Jesus, in the most literal sense, is calling us to count the cost that comes with following him. He says, if you are going to build a tower for us, if we are going to refurnish our sanctuary, sanctuary with new chairs, first, we are going to need to sit down and count the cost of refurnishing our sanctuary with new chairs. There are costs, that are, of course, to our, our monetary, but there's also the cost of switching from pews to chairs, right? The king in verse 30, verses 31 through 32, he isn't primarily concerned about the lost and the cost of of money that he stands to lose. Rather, he's concerned first about the loss in people, the loss in peace that he's about to lose. When you make a change like pews to chairs, certainly when you make a life change that comes with completely following Jesus, there is going to be a cost that comes far beyond a financial cost. It's going to be peace in your relationships, especially with those who have yet to come to faith in Jesus. Those relationships might suffer. When you take pews out and switch to chairs, there might be some that don't like that, right? There might be some that don't understand that move. The same is very true of our relationships, of our plans, of our lives here on earth when we choose to fully follow Jesus. In all things, this most important thing that is following Jesus, we have to count the cost. We have to ask ourselves truly and rightfully answer, is it worth it? Is this worth it to me? Is the cost that is coming worth it to me? To follow Jesus. Does Jesus, are we committed, committed to giving Jesus priority number one in our relationships and in our plans? Are we committed to following Jesus when the ramifications come to changing our priorities in our relationships and our plans? Then, verse 33, Jesus gives us, calls us to give him priority when it comes to our possessions. Jesus says in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. You know, we have the old adages in our world. You can't take it with you, right? You never see a U-Haul attached, or yeah, you never see a U-Haul attached to a hearse. Those adages, they focus on the reality that you cannot take your possessions with you to the next life. And that is certainly true. But what Jesus seems to be more concerned about here is that we see that we can't take our possessions necessarily with us in our new life in Christ here on earth. Right? If we are going to wholly and fully follow Jesus, then he and our following of him needs to be priority number one, even priority over the things that we possess or the things that we seek to possess. I always like to hear pastor and author David Platt speak about this verse and this reality of discipleship because he always says, he always gives that, gives that caveat that many pastors give when you come to a verse like this. Now, I'm not saying that God is calling you to sell everything you have and go move to a foreign country and live there as a missionary. I'm not saying that. But then David always says, I'm also not saying that, right? I'm also not not saying that, right? I'm also not saying that God isn't calling you to sell all you have and move to a far, foreign land for the sake of the spread of the gospel, right? right? There is nothing wrong with possessions. There is nothing sinful about possessions. There's nothing even sinful about having nice possessions. 
But when the priority of holding on to or gaining more of those possessions come, becomes the priority over our relationship and our following of Jesus, then we have a problem. Jesus calls us to set him as our priority. Him as the priority in all of our relationships, in all of our plans, and in all of our possessions. And then he closes with what we have already looked at by saying this. By saying, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is to be thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Remember again, where the passage begins. Remember the passage begins with crowds simply traveling, not actually following, but traveling Jesus. Jesus wants them. He's in challenging them. He's inviting them to move from just traveling with him to actually following him and being his disciple. And to do that, he challenges our priorities. And then he ends where he began with that reminder that salt is good. But if salt, if our discipleship loses its discipleshipness, if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? What is it? worth in that moment, right? Like salt, if it's not salty, it's fit for neither the soil nor the manure pile. Jesus calls us in these verses to count the cost. He says, come follow me, come follow me one and all, but one and all, consider the cost that comes with following me. He asks us, are we willing to pay the cost? Are you willing to preserve in paying the cost? Even as it costs you serious things, in your life, are you willing to preserve and preserve the faith? Salt is good, salt is good, but if either quickly or eventually it loses its saltiness, if we either quickly or eventually lose our faith, our faith to preserve and our faith to preserve the faith, what good was our faith, right? Jesus calls us to count the cost. I believe the big idea of this passage, it rests in verse number 27. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. I believe the big idea in a sentence is a Christian without a cross is not a Christian. And I think there's a twofold meaning to that in verse number 27. First, without the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Without that cross, without the forgiveness of sins, without the cleansing of his blood, without the washing of his broken body, we cannot be his disciples. We cannot be made right with God. We cannot have our sin removed, that divider that keeps us from God. We cannot have that moved and be moved into right relationship with God without the cross, without our belief in our heart that Jesus Christ died on the heart to pay the price for our sins and that God raised him to new life as well. And if we place our faith in that resurrection, we have his new life as well. Without that cross, we cannot have faith in Jesus Christ. We are not a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the first aspect of the cross that needs to be applied to our lives if we are to be a Christian. But also, we cannot be Christ's disciples without our own cross, without our own cross that we actually pick up and carry in our pursuit of Jesus. And that's where I want to begin. That's where we continued our discussion on Monday evening when we gathered here around our tables as a body. And I would invite you in your own personal time to think about this question that we began our discussion with. When it comes to a cross, when it comes to verse number 27 and our picking up of our cross, what do we think of? Do we automatically think of selling all that we have and moving to a foreign land as a missionary? Now, I think that is certainly a version of picking up your cross and following Jesus, a great version that I'm not discouraging. If God is calling us to a foreign land, then go to a foreign land and spread the gospel. But that's not the only version of picking up a cross that we need to live out as followers of Christ. I think a, a big part of picking up our cross and following Jesus is willing to repent of our sin, right? right? Repentance from sin, whether it's an addiction, it's sexual immorality, whatever we are tempted to sin, that's not an easy thing to do, right? There's a burden that comes from that. Sin is tempting and it can be blinding. It's hard to stay focused on that narrow path that leads to light and love in Jesus Christ. There's a cross that comes. There's a burden to bear with laying down our sin, picking up our cross and following Jesus. So think about that. 
pray about that. How is Jesus calling you to pick up your cross today in, in practical senses? Is he calling you to serve in your local church? Is he calling you to be a part of the local church? Also, practically and personally, is he calling you to pick up your cross and repent of a sin? To leave behind the sin that you have carried with you to this moment. To leave it at his feet and to go forward leaving it at his, at his feet as you follow him. To carry that burden with you, but knowing that what you are gaining in your pursuit of Jesus Christ is so much greater than the burden that you leave behind. So, I pray for you as you go forward that you would be able to follow Jesus Christ either for the first time in your life or in a deeper, fresher sense as you go forward, living the light of Jesus Christ out in this world. Thanks for joining us today. Again, next week we're going to look at Matthew chapter 23. So in the week ahead, please prepare for that study and be ready to join us as we gather around God's word. I invite you to join us Monday night at 7 p.m. right here at Techway Church, 5482, for the on-site, in-person version of this study. If you can't make it to that for whatever reason, we'd love to have you here online on our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless the rest of your day.